they get thrilled because they lose eight pounds of water weight during their initial dieting period. Well, along with the water that you lose, you also lose important minerals. And one of the most important ones to lose is calcium. In fact, you lose so much calcium through your kidneys this way that you can't compensate. I don't care how much milk that you consume or dairy products. I don't care how many calcium pills that you take. You can't compensate for the loss that's caused by this high protein in your diet. If the only way you can get into a situation where you can keep more calcium in your body than you're losing through your kidneys is to slow down the amount of protein that you eat and slow down the calcium and losses. And replace it with what? What you replace it with? What would you like to know what you can eat? Is that what you <laughs> That's my question. General, yes, general okay. question. So far, I'm hungry. All right. The, the idea is, okay, what you do is you consume a diet that's been consumed by most people in the history of the world. That's a starch-based meal plan. It's based around rice like the Asians consumed, based around potatoes like the Irish consumed for many years. You can base it around uh, various pasta dishes. How about spaghetti with a tangy marinara sauce? Mm -hmm. How about uh, a hot German potato salad? How about Indian curry dishes? If the evidence that you have is so strong, then why are we not hearing more about that from the majority of the medical community? Well, it has to do with special interests. The issue is, is if we're going to tell people about the protein, the damage in I take my first ride on the Sky Train are Messrs. Stu Hudson, Chairman of BC Transit and Chief Executive Officer, and Michael O'Connor, the General Manager. Later, we're going to turn to a more somber subject. There is nothing sadder than seeing families in British Columbia having to raise, raise large sums of money from friends and organizations to take youngsters down to the United States for organ transplants. But we're not sitting still about this. And in the studio today, I have Dr. Robin Hutchinson of the BC Transplant Society, who is acting executive director of hospital programs in British Columbia. And he's going to tell us what we in British Columbia are planning to do to make it easier and cheaper and more efficient for British Columbians who need transplants presently possible. But first, Step lively with Webster on his first ride on the Sky Train after the break. Well, just the average downtown New Westminster commuter. Going to catch the bus down to the ALRT and do my first run on the LRT. How are you doing? Not bad. How I are work you? all the time. What's your name? Merv Whitehouse. Merv, how long have you been driving this? Oh, eight and a half years. How much do you want? Well, for senior citizens, 50 cents. I'm a senior <laughs> citizen, but I haven't got 50 cents. Well, you're, 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 uh, anybody can change a dollar here for anybody a Anybody change a dollar? Time? Can anybody change a dollar? <laughs> Give me 50 cents. You got 50 cents? Yeah. Just takes a few minutes Just to the 50 get cents, here. love. That's fine. Okay, thank you very <laughs> much. Thank your name, ma'am? Martha Pankrat. Martha? Pankrat. Pankrat. Nice to meet you, Martha. One, two, 50 cents. Now, I want to go on the LRT. Yes, Jack. You don't remember me, do you? No, I don't. Oh, yeah, for a few years back, I used to be an auxiliary, and we met one one of your, your uh, seminars. Oh, I see. Well, you're yeah. a police auxiliary. Yeah. Right. Right. Long time. How long have you been driving the bus? Eight and a half years. Well, you're looking well on it. Oh, yes. Very good. Very Certainly good. haven't lost weight on it. No, that is for sure. That is for sure. The well, RRT, you get off here, Jack, and you go around the corner to that little green building there. You mean I got to walk around? Well, uh, if you want to stay a few minutes, uh, yes, but I change signs. <laughs> Thanks very much, ma'am. Thanks, Mrs. Pankrat. You have a good program. Yes, yes. Thank you. Hi, Mike. Michael O'Connor. Nice to see you. Hi, Mr. Hudson. Good to see you, Mr. Webster. How are you, Jack? We came down on the bus. Did you? And I'm glad to tell you I got the 50 cent rate. Good. Good. As long as you're paid, that's, that's important. That's for senior. That's for seniors. Good for you. <laughs> Let's go. Well, you're going to use your transfer to get on, are you? As long as it's valid. Let me see if it's valid here. Oh, yeah, you're good for a while yet. But uh, does that mean they go on for free? Yeah. yeah. Once you've paid on a bus, you ride the whole way. Watch yourself. Watch yourself. Have you traveled on the ALRT yet? Not yet. We're really thrilled about it. We're from Saskatoon. From Sa What's your name? Uh, Boucher. But, and this is the old farmer. Yeah, you bet. <laughs> yeah. 
But, and you? I'm the offspring. <laughs> you live here. Yeah, I live You're here. the smart one. I'm the smart one. It's I'll see you on the train. <laughs> 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 Hey, put it in the right way. <laughs> you have to no, no, you have to no, no, one no. of these first. Oh, okay, so I want two, so go ahead. Right. That's it, now you got her. <laughs> look at the camera. <laughs> Come on, look at the camera. What's your name? Natalie. Natalie what? Clement. Clement. Have you been on the earlier? No. Your first trip? Yeah. Best of luck. Thank you. <laughs> Obviously, you don't want to get rid of that money, Jack. Well, it's hard to come by. There we are. Done. Just a question of getting on to it. <laughs> There's my ticket. How come you got more out than what you put in there, Jack? I got one dollar. Now, one tip to Michael O'Connor that I must also do, and I've got to pay somebody else's fare, that's my transfer from the bus. Yes, and what that can transfer I do? is good on LRT down to Waterfront Station. So your transfer on the bus is good. That's all. You just take that, no, oh, you take just that, take with that on me. there, and they'll check it on the train for you, and that's a valid ticket. On I got my ticket, I got my change, and I've got my transfer for myself. Yes. Wonderful. Where did you get that hat? Yeah, in Scotland. Hey, isn't that beautiful? Yeah, that's the hat. Isn't that wonderful? Look at the hat. <laughs> Look at the hat. Hey, what's your name? Jane Paul. C-O-L-E? Yes, yes. Can I tie your hat on? Yeah, try the... <laughs> Just see it, don't you? <laughs> it's too weak for me. Yes, yeah, so I enjoy your programs. Thanks very much, Jane. I've tried all the machines in here and none of them will take it. He says it's too faded and it won't work. i got to find somebody to give me change. I was just talking well, to your station it. attendant. Was that right? Yeah. He says it's too old and it won't work. Well, let's try it. Sure. See, they're both down to one dollar exactly, right? All right. Who are you? I'm the chairman of the board. Oh, okay. <laughs> there you are. This reminds me of the old country, standing on a station platform, freezing, <laughs> waiting for a train. Um, tell me, Mr. O'Connor, do they run to a schedule or do they just run kind of ad hoc? They're all on schedule, Jack. We run about a four to five minute schedule in the rush hour and then it varies up to about a ten minute schedule late at night. And there's no attendance on the car? Yes, there's an attendant on every train. Oh, I didn't know that. For the first few months, maybe even longer, we, are, we have people on the train to make sure everything runs right for the passengers. And then after that, you might... Depending on how it goes, we might reduce the number of attendants. That's right. Good, good. We're going to take the next train. We're going to take the next train. Now watch what happens here. This is where you've got to step lively or you may well get pressed in the door. There's a woman here who just about makes it, but she doesn't. And Mike Connor later explains the timing uh, arrangements of the train doors. You couldn't get in, could no, you? No, every time I went to go in, the door <laughs> shut on me. So that's that's the start. That's the first time I've been on the trip. Well, we'll, we'll make sure you get on the second one. What's what's the score on that? Jack, that train was behind schedule, and so it stays in the station for 30 seconds, and then it, it goes right back. If it was on schedule, it would have stayed two minutes, and it would have there would have been more time to board. It, we had to get it out of here in a hurry because the next train is about a minute behind it, and we'll get on it. Is that not a danger, though? A little bit of a... I mean, this delightful lady here, if she had pushed these doors, would they have opened? Yes, if, if she'd pushed more forcefully, she could have opened them and stepped through. 
but that the bell chime is to warn you that the doors are closing and then the doors start to close and they'll try five times and then the train will well, leave. There is a bell chime yes. that's warning you. I yes. I didn't hear a bell. Didn't you? No, I didn't well, hear this, any bell. This train will get on. You listen for it when you get in. You can hear the, the bell chiming as the doors are closing. Oh, I see. Yeah. What's your name? Margaret Hansen. Yeah, Sheila from Australia. No, from New Zealand. Or oh, Kiwi. <laughs> yes. Sorry about that. That's all right. I get it all the time. <laughs> But the Kiwi and I wait there a few moments and we catch the second train after the break. In Tokyo they have uh, pushers to jab people in, but everyone here is so polite you don't need that kind of thing. Now we've got lots of time this time. There's the bell chime. Okay, get on. Come on. What's been your biggest day on the system up to now? Friday was the biggest day. We had a revenue day. We had around 55 to 60,000 people on the system last Friday. That was a revenue, money collecting yeah, day. That's right. And today it looks like it's a little bit bigger than Friday. But you had 22,000 yesterday or something on Sunday. I think it was more than that. I think it was nearly double that, Jack. But, how, but you, there's no turnstile. You don't count me. How do you know? I mean, you're only guessing at your traffic. That's right. It's not an, a deadly accurate count. We're within probably about three, two, three thousand. When we say we had sixty thousand people on, we could be out by about uh, two to three thousand, about five percent. Yeah. Be nice to have turnstiles to know exactly how many people you had. Oh, well, your ticket machines, or oh, ticket machines, will give you a week's take or whatever. Well, oh, by the way. Isn't that where the trains are driven from over there, Michael? The very top of that building is our control center, and the floors below it are the maintenance center. Here, this is where we store our trains and inspect and maintain them. And this is where you drive them from, really, up there. Is That's that right? right. The heart of the system is up there. That's where our computers are all kept. This is Boulder Alley. And they tell me you can see rocks that have been thrown over the fence on the odd occasion. But we hope it comes to the end of that. These are the fences they're talking about where the sign and the rocks were thrown over. They're about eight feet, I would imagine, with the barbed wire on top. Somebody's got to go to an effort to attempt to vandalize it. It's so stupid as to be unbelievable. One serious thing I wanted to raise with the gentleman as we came past Boulder Alley there, Eastern Nanaimo, is there's really nothing you can do to stop deliberate vandalism or destruction on a track which is so readily available, is it? If somebody wants to do something very deliberate in our country, it, it's very hard to do it no matter where you are. It's, uh, we're a law-abiding society and if they decide to do it, we don't have the wherewithal to stop it. Uh, you had only had that one bad incident so far, right? Yeah, that's right. You know, we could uh, put the fences up, put uh, spotlights on and sirens and things like that, but it'd be like a Stalag 16, and yeah. nobody wants that. And uh, you just have to hope that uh, that kind of thing will uh, uh, wane after the people get used to it. I think it's just one or two people doing it. Now, uh, let's get back to the fact you have an attendant on the train, and you have an estimate of the traffic. But supposing there's some massive big event down at BC Place, how are you going to avoid real overloading? Just the, 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 attendance, the attendance duty, is it? Or is it the quickness of the opening and closing of the doors? Jack, this is one of the great benefits of this system, that we can store empty trains all over this system. And then when a, a stadium event or a major expo event occurs, put those trains into service in a matter of seconds, faster than any other system that we know of, to get rid of the heavy loads that would come onto the system. You're almost bound to put the fares up for Expo. So let me ask you this question. Will the fares stay as they are now during Expo and the balance of 86? Yes, as far as we know now. We have no plans to No plans. It. No. 
We decided to get off at the Granville Station here, which is right underneath where, Michael? Right under the Hudson Bay, Jack. We walk around the corner here, and we'll be right in the Hudson Bay, and then a short walk over to Pacific Center. So this will be the principal downtown shopping stop, you might say. Yes, and then the principal, two principal areas for business would be Burrard and Waterfront. Burrard and the Waterfront. So from here, Granville, Burrard and the Waterfront. Yes. There's your three big stations in That's the right. downtown area. That's right. This cost a fortune, this bit, didn't it? This is the only one that really resembles the London Underground. This is one of our most expensive stations, but it's almost all entirely under Seymour Street, so the city gave us the land. It wasn't a costly thing for, from the land acquisition point of view. <laughs> Do you want your baby to be on television? Oh, yeah, you bet, you, can you have bet. your baby on television. Hey, his name is Nolan. Nolan what? Nolan Hubert. He's from Bonanza, Alberta. Are you from Bonanza, Alberta? You bet. You look like it, too. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> How old is Nolan? He's um, four months. Four months. Is this your first? That's right. And you're so bald. What have you been Sorry. doing all these years? Is this Mrs. Nolan? Yeah. yeah. It's Mrs. Nolan. First baby? Yeah. Is it, I hope it's a boy. Yeah. That's right. Oh, thank goodness. It's a boy. <laughs> nice to meet you. Have yeah. a ball. Jack, this is the longest escalator in Canada, and we're just headed up right now to the sub-basement in the bay, and then we go through the Hudson Bay and out onto Granville Street. Now, we're back on the same platform at Granville, and we're going to go to the waterfront. Now, here is the, uh, the electric transmission lines. Now, just tell me, if I fall onto that, that aluminum-colored pod in the middle, will I get electrocuted? No, Jack, there's nothing to worry about there between the tracks. The yellow covered thing right across from the tracks is the power rail, and that has 600 volts direct current in it. And you could get electrocuted if you touch that. All right, now, but if I go onto that gray pad, what happens? That's what we call our limb rail. That's what drives the train. The red pads on either side of that are the platform safety devices. If you step or fall down on that on the, between the tracks, it instantly breaks the train. Any weight on the red pads on either side of the gray track will stop the train? Will instantly stop the train, that's correct. Does that mean it will stop every train in the system? No, only a train in the, in the area of the station. Any other train further away from the station would gradually come to a stop. But if it's an emergency situation, for instance, the train coming down right now, if somebody fell off the, the track onto the track, that train would emergency brake and stop as quickly as possible. Well, we're not about to test it, but you've tested it, I presume. Yes, it's tested. It'd be easy enough to test with weights, wouldn't it? That's what we do, is we drop a standard weight onto it and make sure that it stops. It stops the nearest train instantly and slows the other trains down until the problem is clear. That's right, and then we send somebody down to make sure that there's nobody injured. And your boys in the um, control centers will know what has happened when a train stops. That's correct. They get a, a signal immediately as well. Right. All aboard. All aboard. Prepare to show your tickets, please. I'm the inspector today. Yeah, that's a good ticket. That's good until 3.40 uh, p.m. Enjoy your ride in the LRT. It's quite nostalgic to come out of the magnificent old CPR station in downtown Vancouver after my first run from New Westminster to the waterfront in the Sky Train. Maybe all kinds of problems ahead, but it certainly looks like a magnificent system. But you've got to step lively when you're boarding the trains. And I have two people in the studio who will step lively to answer your questions. Stu Hudson and Mike O'Connor, after the break. I want to get something straight right now with the, the chairman, Stu Hudson. I asked you on the car yesterday, will the fares stay as they are now and during Expo and for the balance of 86? And you give me a pretty positive yes, they will. Well, Jack, uh, I have to apologize to you. I should have uh, explained it in a little greater depth. And uh, I also apologize to the station. What happens, I can give you a firm uh, statement to the end of the fiscal year, which is March 31st, that fares will not change. 86. Uh, March, eight, March 31st, 1986. Uh -huh. As for what happens after, 
it depends on the results of our budget. We have submitted our budget to Victoria. Uh, we have not yet received uh, any uh, information as to what's happened to it. And secondly, it's not me that sets the fares. It's the Regional Transit Commission. And I would think that the Commission will be meeting uh, early in the new fiscal year and uh, they will uh, look at it. Now, uh, the way you asked the question, I said that I didn't have any uh, plans to increase the fares, but uh, uh, it's not me that makes the decision. Hopefully they won't go up. Well, I would hope that they uh, wouldn't. It'll all depend on the ridership. We uh, merged together the buses and the ALRT on, uh, in March, and uh, as you know, we're checking it very, very carefully, and uh, we hope they won't go up. But a firm decision we made early in the new uh, fiscal year. Right now. Um, Question to you, when are you going to integrate the bus and the RAP and the SkyTrain schedules? Jack, there's a lot of the buses that are integrated now. The bus you got on there in New Westminster drops you off right at the station. But we have another major integration of the system in March, and then another one uh, for Expo, and then another one after Expo when we remove the Expo shuttle. And you're going to change minor changes in the routes and minor changes in bus stops so that you stop as close as you can to the station. We'll be changing quite a few routes in March to provide more service to every station and improve the, the level of service, more buses. When do you get to White Rock? When do you get into Surrey? We're headed to Surrey very soon. In fact, the bridge will be called in another two or three months across the Fraser River. Just on the fares. If the ridership were to go down, the fares will go up. But with Expo, your ridership's going to be up. Well, we think it will. We think that uh, the uh, SkyTrain is going to be not the, but one of the... Uh, premier attractions for uh, Expo, and uh, this should help us a lot. Mm -hmm. It certainly gives you an incredible new look at the lower mainland, doesn't it? Well, the mountains, it that extra does. 100 feet or whatever you are above the city just gives an incredible vista. As you know, I was born in this city uh, just a few years ago, but in any event, uh, I have to tell you that riding on SkyTrain, uh, I see things that I never saw before. Go ahead, please. Yeah, New Westminster has always had poor parking facilities, and I was just wondering if they plan on building a large parkade right by the station in New Westminster there. There's a big parkade along the waterfront there over Front Street that I understand now is nearly full every morning. Uh, we think that there will be additional parking provided as, as development occurs there. Yeah, so but we surely, haven't got anything surely we've got to learn to grow up and walk to stations like they do in other metropoli around the world. You, you get the old lady to drop you off if she's not working and she, and she has a car, and you, or, or you walk to the station. Well, walking, Jack, and we expect a lot of people to start using the bus system because it will be fully integrated here in the next month or so. Go ahead, please. Yes, uh, what happens when you put an American dollar bill in that uh, oh, yes. machine, ticket machine? How does it accept it? If the machine's working just the way it should, you get your dollar back. You no. get the American exchange back? No, oh, oh, it, it won't accept your dollar. Oh, it won't, eh? No, you what have to use Canadian put, currency. What happens if I put a Deutschmark bill in? Will I get my bill back, my change back in German if currency? It would, <laughs> if it would fit, you'll get it back. No, that's a stupid question. But let's go this way. We had considerable difficulty yesterday, all of which we weren't able to show, about the crumple bills and about the $5 bill. Now, a number of people had to go through two or three times. What's the answer to that? It's a burn-in problem, it's, and that's a technical, it won't burn your dollar bill, but as the machines are, are uh, brand new, they're from Switzerland, and we've had three or four people here from Switzerland going through all the machines, adjusting them, and it'd be about another week or two before they're, they're fully adjusted and working properly. And so some of the problems are startup problems. And the other problems are, as you noticed, a lot of people are putting the bill in wrong, upside down, backwards. Once they get used to it, it won't be a problem. Well, I'm afraid you got me there. I'm the machine. There's the machine. Put that bill in the proper way. Put it. The Queen's head first. The right Queen's right head on the right-hand side. Oh, the Queen's head on the left-hand side of the machine. Right. As I'm standing at the machine, I put the Queen's head in. If I do it that way, it won't go. No, it won't work. What the hell difference does the Queen's head make? Well, it's uh, an automatic uh, uh, machine, and 
uh, it's so uh, programmed to do that. And to of take course, the head and recognize he's the queen's face, more or less. Jack it reads the entire bill, it, and it has to because we take ones, twos, and fives. It reads the entire bill, and if you don't put it in exactly right, it will just give it back to you. If I put it in upside down, it won't go. It'll go through, but you'll get it back. All right. If I put it in the wrong way around, it will go through and come back. Correct. So I've got to take my dollar bill and my five dollar bill, which is the maximum. Right. And I've got to hold the queen's ha head under my left thumb and put it in that way. Correct. Everybody's going to have to learn that. That's right. And step lively. I want you to explain these times later to me, but we'll do the phones first. Go ahead, please. I was just wondering, okay, I take the LRT every day because it's really close to me, but I have to get off at the Edmund Station and walk about four blocks. Okay, but it's pitch black. Do they plan on adding any street lights or anything? Because it's really dangerous. There's a little gully there in the ditch. You never know what can happen when you're walking home from work. That's a, a really good question, Jack. We, Some of the roads that have been built into the stations are not properly lit yet, and we're dealing, we're talking with the municipalities, and I believe that lady is walking along the parkway. Right that, up to Salisbury, to right, Kingsway. Right, right. Uh, in that area, we have a park that uh, the minister has been f instrumental in creating, and we're in the throes of putting lights along the park that's not lit now. And that's one of the areas that will be lit, lit well lit, in the next few months. And BC Transit is taking the responsibility for these lights in your dark areas. Oh, yes. We will have to, uh, we'll have to uh, uh, make a contribution, if not uh, a, a full contribution. Go ahead, please. Good morning, gentlemen. What I'd like to know is with your integration of buses uh, in March, the Kingsway route will be broken into three buses. If someone has to make a stop along Kingsway, such as Earls Road or Broadway and uh, Kingsway, they're going to end up having to make uh, at least two transfers as opposed to no transfers. Now, uh, would you not think it better to keep at least the Kingsway bus at least to Joyce Road Loop, the, the 6th Street, 12th Street, to at least Joyce Road Loop, and uh, so people don't have to make as many transfers if they have to go along on the buses? Well, I... I think there will be uh, some fine-tuning will have to be uh, done. Uh, this is a, a first for uh, the Lower Mainland, and uh, we've uh, looked at it on the basis of uh, uh, traffic patterns uh, and uh, ridership, but there's no doubt about it, there will be some fine-tuning done uh, over the next six months. Okay, okay. More calls to Messrs. Hudson and O'Connor after the break. Larry Ward, who is the vice president in charge of planning. What about uh, fair saver tickets and route adjustments without too much detail on the routes? Well, the fare saver is just another way of paying your fare on the transit system. Basically, you buy books of tickets in uh, some 350 outlets we have. Uh, one of the most dominant ones are corner grocery stores. And it's a matter of buying 10 tickets for the price of uh, nine. So you get a free or ticket for every 10. That's right. You can get an all-day pass for two and a quarter. That's correct. It uh, only goes on sale after 9.30 in the morning, so commuters can't use it for their trip in and out. But that's only available at the LRT stations. <coughs> 2.25, and that's uh, the yeah. extent of the fifth saver ticket concessions. That's right. There that's also is a monthly pass. but much is that? Uh, that depends on whether it's a single zone, two zone. Or three zone. Right. Well, roughly, you save 10%. That's right. Go ahead, please. Yeah, good morning. Uh, I would just like to ask a few. I think the system is great. The old transit system in the lower mainland is great. But there's one thing. Uh, I commute from uh, North Van to, or Vancouver to North Van and vice versa. And on Sundays, uh, the service is really terrible. Uh, three weeks ago, Sunday night, uh, 11.30 at night. Are you talking about buses? Well, this is re referring to buses because on Sunday... No, I don't want to talk about buses. We're talking about the sky train. I want to take complaints or praise or problems about... I'm not doing bus questions. Go ahead, please. Yes, I want to know about this noise factor. It seems so terribly noisy looking at it on TV. Why is it and what is it like inside? Inside, it's like any other tube you've been in in your life. It sways a little, it jolts a little, it's got a pleasant grinding sound in your ear. 
Why is the noise so heavy on the outside? Because it's up between. Why is the noise so heavy, she says. Well, Jack, you're right. It's, it's a rapid transit system. It's steel wheels on steel rails, and you're not going to make that quiet. Now, this is the quietest system that we know of anywhere in the world, but it is a light rapid light rail system, and it's noisy. It's the price of progress, isn't it, Stu? Yeah, it is. That's right. I was going to say, where well, there's noise, there's money. Go ahead, please. Good morning, Jack. Good morning. Mr. Hodgson, Mr. O'Connor. Morning. My question uh, regards the accessibility from car to car by your RTAs. I um, am aware that uh, under your present system that the RTAs are unable to move from car to car when the train is, in fact, in motion unlike most other uh, systems in the world. Okay, let's check that. Uh, you can't move from car to car, and your attendants can't move either from car to car, except in an emergency, is that right? No, that's not right. Uh, Jack, the, uh, the rapid transit attendant, by the way, is the person, our conductor on our trains. Uh, the doors between the trains are, they have a key, and they can crew the doors between the cars and, and in an emergency, and also on, on regular basis on an irregular basis. We don't like them doing it often. They can go from car to car. This is while the train is in motion? Yes. I see. I fooled you, hey? Go ahead, please. Yes, uh, I'm wondering uh, two things. Uh, I use the SkyTrain quite a bit myself, and I'm wondering, uh, okay, I live in the Champlain Heights area, and I get on at Joyce Road there. Now, there's a problem. The entrance on Joyce Road is blocked, so I have to go across the road. You can't really cross there, because there's no real crosswalk there. I'm wondering when they're supposed to have that completed there. And my second question is, uh, how come on Sunday they only run it from 12 until 6? I'll hang up and listen for your answer. Take the second one first, brother. Two good questions. Uh, it's like moving into a new house. You're in and happy about it, but there are a lot of things you want to fix. Now, if we run a full 20-hour service on Sundays, we don't have any time to fix the thing up. So we're running a limited service for a few months. Hopefully, by the end of February, we'll have full Sunday service for everybody. That's what we're aiming for. So we've got a month or two to clean up some of our, our unfinished details on the system, do some more maintenance. Joyce Road. Joyce Road. This, the cold weather in November beat us. We're not finished with that intersection. It should be better in a few weeks. Go ahead, please. Yes, good morning, gentlemen. Um, I was just making an observation. Uh, you've been saying, Jack, about stepping lively. Yep. But I did notice in your short little uh, show there that most of the passengers were embarking and disembarking at the same time. Is it's there any plans to make uh, signs available to let people know, to let the people on the train get off first, and then the people can get back on? It would make it much faster than trying to push and shove and trying to get around people all the time? That is a hell of a good point, because with that fairly short time span, especially if your train is running late and it's only going to be 30 seconds, uh, at the terminus or whatever. It's very difficult. What could you do? You have, you've only got one door in each car. Two doors in each car. Can you come in one and go out another? No, but what will happen over time is, it's like elevators, that they'll get used to letting the people off the elevator first and, and then on. Uh, that's the problem here. Our passengers aren't used to the system yet, and we're we're training them with our station attendants to let the people off the train and, and then board themselves. And we're also increasing our dwell times in some stations so that they, that can happen. Don't use words like dwell times. You mean you're going to stop longer in some stations? Correct, correct. Yeah. Right. One thing we can assure you, we're not going to use the system they use in Tokyo where we put white gloves on the attendants and push everybody in. Yeah. But about the fact, we, people in this part of the world are a little bit of local yokels when it comes to using high-speed movements in transit. Look at the way they behave on the streets. They challenge motorists to knock them down, don't they? <laughs> Who dare meddle with me? I'm protected by the law. <laughs> Go ahead, please. Good morning, Jack. I just uh, wanted to make a comment that uh, I'm sorry you didn't show the main terminal, which is at Gerard and Melville and Dunsmuir. That's a beautiful uh, piece, of, piece of architecture, and I think they should be congratulated on the way it was laid out. It also has shopping there. You can go to the Royal Center Mall and the Hyatt Hotel and, and uh, the, the Bent Hall building, and I, I think maybe you ought to put a little bit more on your program next time and maybe show the, the, the main terminal in downtown Vancouver. What do you think? Which is your store. Which is my store? Yeah. We have the Ellen Logan store in the Royal Theater Mall. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it. Smelled that cold, didn't it? Go ahead, please. 
Good morning. Do uh, these gentlemen expect the 100 airport bus service from Port Coquitlam to the new Westminster Skytrain uh, station will be uh, increased? Right now it's only an hourly service. Laddie? There are no immediate plans to make any increase, but it'll be adjusted to, re to respond to demand. I was just thinking that maybe for the uh, morning commuter rush in the afternoon, uh, an hour seems a bit of a long wait if you just arrive just after the bus has left the station. Get up earlier. The big pardon? Get up earlier. Get up earlier. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> OK, <laughs> boy. Go ahead, please. Yes, good morning. Yeah. To these two gentlemen, I was quite amazed yesterday speaking to a person from Montreal, <coughs> and he was commenting that our system is quieter and quieter than the Toronto, uh, Montreal system. Then he turned around and he said, well, he said, it's just as good for sure, he said. Plus, it's better riding it because riding the tube, he says, is very dreary. <coughs> riding above ground is just beautiful. And I was also speaking to a person from London, uh, uh, London England, and he was saying, telling me that this system stands up to anything, the newest technology they have in the London tube. Thank you, sir. Looks like you've got friends. Go ahead, please. I was wondering if you realize the loss in revenue that, that SkyTrain is going to have, because a person riding from Surrey to take the SkyTrain into Vancouver technically only needs a two-zone fare instead of a three-zone fare. Because once you get off the bus in New Westminster and get back on it, they don't know where you've come from, and you technically only need a red transfer. Laddie? No, that's not correct. You still require a three-zone ticket. How are you going to prove that, that I haven't got off of a New Westminster bus and walked across the street? Because of the transfer that you is punched on the bus from Surrey. And how closely are you looking at that? They're, they're checked randomly on the LRT system, and from time to time there'll be full sweeps. And, and what if I buy a book of tickets for a, for a two-zone fare? and get off of my bus in New Westminster and get back onto the Sky Train. Because the bus driver lets me off in New Westminster is a two-zone fare. Well, you would have to deposit your ticket and get a transfer when you got on the bus in Surrey. OK. And he'd give me a transfer, right? That's correct. And the transfer would be punched to identify the route that you uh, boarded the bus on. And are there all tra they're all transfers are punched now? They're supposed to be. Thank you, ma'am. Go ahead, please. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. Um, I'd like to know why the system shuts down so early. You see all these commercials of uh, don't drink and drive, use a tax cab, use a um, transit system, but when you go to use the transit system at night, it closes down at 12.15, the last train leaving Vancouver. If you live in Surrey, how are you supposed to go out and drink in Vancouver and then have to drive home? And you can't use the transit system when... The transit system should be staying open until all the bars are closed in Vancouver and everybody can get a ride home. Thank you. Who wants to tackle that one, Stuart? Are you going to extend the sky train time so that every drunk or unwise person can get a train home even if he's by himself? No, I don't think so. I think we, uh, the object of the operation is to try and run a good service in the most efficient way we can. And I'm afraid that we can't... Uh, run it into the wee hours of the morning just for one or two that's having difficulty uh, navigating home. Okay. That wonderful. I heard oh, it all. Oi! Thank you very much, ma'am. Listen, I heard all that. Nobody, do you know that Webster got on with one person holding his right arm and another person holding his left arm? Who'd do that for me? And then he was allowed to run down the aisle and change his dollar. Who'd do that for for me. I would do it for you. But I'm nearly blind. But you won't let Webster answer that. I do it. You're on the air just now talking to Webster, ma'am. Oh. <laughs> and you, you're making me feel kind of humble. I was there. It doing, does make me feel kind of humble. Makes okay. me feel kind of humble. But I'll help you if I see you, love. And thanks for your call. I was only doing a little television program. Well, Mr. Webster, you're talking to me right now. Yes, ma'am. There would be no way no one would help me that way. Oh, I'm No way. Oh, I'm sure they would. Give me a no, call. No, you're wrong. You're wrong. Okay. Nobody would help me no, that no, way. No, no, no. I would help you. Lot Stu no, Oxen would help you. You won't be there, Mr. Webster. No, I know. These Thanks. are paid. Okay. Thanks, my dear. Jack, on that, we our attendants are trained. This is the most accessible 
system for handicapped people in the world. And we've really worked hard at making that uh, totally accessible. Now, if that lady needs help, the rapid transit attendants are trained to assist the uh, physically disabled, blind, anybody that has troubles, elderly, there's elevators, we have... Yeah, I know, I can get to the platform in my wheelchair, but how the hell, how am I going to get in there? When the attendants inside the train to begin there's with. There's station attendants on the platforms and there are people in the train. Now, if you need help, all you have to do is ask, and they're specially trained. They'll stop the train a little extra time for you to get you on and get you off. My thanks to Stu Hodgson, to Mike O'Connor, and to Larry Ward. Thanks for being here, Larry. And we'll keep an eye on your sky train and do a little shots from time to time. Well, Jack, uh, in response to what that lady said, she seems to have a preference for you. So we're going to give you a pass, and in your spare time, you can ride the system and help uh, people like that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Stu. Next, a serious interview with Dr. Robin Hutchinson of the BC Transplant Society and the Hospital Administration and the Department of Health and British Columbia Government after the break. Thanks, Jack. <laughs> A 38-year-old uh, man from Prince Rupert is uh, apparently recovering well from a heart transplant he received in Edmonton. And that little four-year-old Delta girl is still waiting for a liver, liver transplant at a Minnesota hospital, and she'll need a double transplant. Now, a lot of transplants have been done in British Columbia, but I have with me this morning Dr. Robin Hutchinson, who is the um, proper government title. Acting Executive Director of Hospital Program. Hospital Program. And you're also uh, the BC Transplant Society. What are we trying to do in British Columbia to increase the number of organ transplants, and what do you want the public to do? The first thing we're trying to do is to get an increased number of kidney transplants. That's the transplant procedure that's been around the longest. It's the best understood and has a lot of potential recipients. And in order to do that, we need to get an increased number of donors and of course once we get the the uh, donor procurement if you will forgive that word uh, program going then we can start to look for other um, transplant endeavors such as hearts and livers are we badly behind in our transplant program when this guy young man 38 has to go to Edmonton to a heart transplant or these children keep going down for liver transplants in the United States does that make us backwards not really, because in order to do these things well, you have to do lots. And to do lots, you have to have a wide referral base. So we start out by, by sending our people to where the expertise lie. And I think that's where you'd want to go, that's where I'd want to go. And until the program is uh, at the level where you have a decent sort of volume, I think it's much better to have people go to where the, where the experts are, where the volume is. So we're sending our people to Eastern Canada, to California, to Minnesota, because they've had the centers going longer, they've had more volume, they've got more experience. Of course, the point is that uh, BCHIS can't always cover the total cost of an expensive operation in the United States. Oh, we cover the uh, cost of the operation. We cover the whole thing, and in some cases it's been exceedingly expensive. But what we don't cover, and what the service clubs have been very generous in covering, are the living expenses for the parents and the travel costs. But all the hospital costs are covered by the people of BC. In other words, whatever the hospital in the United States charges for the actual operational costs are paid for by BCHIS. Definitely, yes. Are yeah. there are there much higher rates than what what it would cost in British Columbia? Probably. They they charge uh, uh, a cost plus a profit, uh, oftentimes. Now, uh, when we talk about transplants, are we really only? What are the organs that you would want people to donate? if they died suddenly or not suddenly? Kidneys, hearts, and livers at the moment. There have been some pancreas transplants and uh, other experimental transplants. The main need in British Columbia right now is for kidneys. We hope uh, eventually to get into hearts and livers. However, if we did get a heart or a liver that was useful to the people in other parts of the country, we can exchange and get that organ to the to the uh, donor in another part what of the world. What about eyes, corneas? Is that a routine one which is well under control and is that done in British Columbia? It certainly is, and you asked about organs. We classify that as a tissue, so I didn't oh, mention I eyes. An but, eye is uh, a tissue. We have an excellent eye bank, uh, which uh, over the last couple of years has quadrupled the number of corneal transplants done in BC. Now, how do I donate my organs? Or how do I make preparation to donate my organs? I think I once had a, 
a, a card, but I've long lost it. What does one do? What kind well, of, what does the BC Transplant Society do about recording or registering somebody's wishes? The first thing that you have to understand is that your wishes are important, but it's also your family's wishes. So you could sign a donor card, sign the part of your driver's license that indicates your preference. But although that is legally sufficient, I don't think that anybody would take your kidneys or whatever without discussing it with your family. So what you should do, if this is what you want to, uh, to have done, is to discuss transplantation with your family so they understand your wishes. Oh, so that the family doesn't uh, double-cross you after you're dead. Well, you could put it that way. Yeah, or, but, but in other words, so that the family don't get surprised by it, finally, that you've donated uh, your heart, your liver. Well, we, your... we really don't want anybody to have any surprises, and we wouldn't do it without your family's permission. So that's why it's wise to discuss this with your family so they know what your wishes are. But do you need a document signed by your family as well as your own? Do you have to sign a document yourself? Legally, that's all that's required. In the real world, we would always ask your family. Mm. But, I mean, if I... Uh, you don't need a legal document as such. Now, do I tell you in advance, if I decide to give my kidneys, my liver, and my heart, for whatever they're worth, uh, do I tell you in the BC Transplant Society? We haven't got a mechanism set up for that yet. We found from uh, asking other jurisdictions that if the right person asks at the right time, 85, 90% of potential donors' families will say yes. We'll say. So really, although we certainly need public support, the, the main target right now has to be with the physicians and the ICU nurses and the emergency room nurses and the doctors because they're a little reluctant to ask at the moment for two reasons, I guess. One is that there's still, in many people's minds, including medical people's minds, the idea that transplantation is a little bizarre, a little off the wall, a little experimental, and not an accepted way of treating end-stage uh, organ failure. And the other is that it's, it's difficult to ask somebody... Um, by definition, a good donor is a young donor. By definition, a young death is a particularly tragic death. And it's very difficult to come in and ask uh, a grieving parent or, or whatnot, you know, sorry, your, your son is dead, can we have his kidneys? However, if you, if you actually can uh, put it in the right way at the right time, a lot of people find it very helpful to find some little bit of good that comes out of a tragedy. Yeah, although I think there has been a tendency where people in those moments of dreadful trauma and grief realize that perhaps they can do one little peripheral piece of good after the exactly. tragedy, as you point Exactly, out. and that, that assuages their guilt and their grief. That's uh, right, and they, they might even suggest it to the ICU people or the family doctor or whatever. Good, I'm going to take questions uh, to Dr. Hutchinson about the BC Transplant Society and the program. And I'm very pleased to hear, I've missed that, that the, 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 the cost of operations done outside British Columbia are fully covered by BCHIS, so we're not going there as charity patients at all. Oh, goodness no. But the service By clubs, no means. You've paid for them. That's right. Yeah. The service clubs, in the meantime, however, have done a valiant job in raising Indeed. money to cover the living costs of the families who go down there. That's correct. Questions to Dr. Hutchinson after the break. <laughs> I remember when Nielsen announced the uh, formation of the BC Transplant Society. Are you going to be the headquarters for all information, care, custody, and use, or, or trading of organs? What we hope to do is to have a coordinated uh, effort between the four hospitals, the three hospitals that will be uh, at present doing transplantation. There'll be the Vancouver General St. Paul's and the, and the Children's Hospital. Uh, the reason I, I said four is that the university will also have a place to uh, play in the, in the society. So there will be uh, representatives from those four institutions plus government. Uh, and what we hope to do is to make sure that the procurement side of it is done as the most, uh, in the most efficient way possible and also make sure that we have a common waiting list. We don't have any competition between hospitals, uh, similar policies, and... Ultimately, I would like to have the information side coordinated, one phone number that could be used, that type of thing. So, yes, we will be uh, getting it all together in the next year or so. Go ahead to Dr. Hutchinson. Yes, um, I recently lost an eye due to a ricocheted pellet. I lost the uh, cornea in my, or not the cornea, the retina in my eye. I'd like to know, I've been told that they cannot do total eye transplants, and I'd like to know why and if anybody is doing any kind of um, work on total eye transplants and how I could get a hold of them. 
I'm really not aware of any uh, anybody that's doing that. I think the main problem is uh, hooking up the optic nerve to the eyeball. The uh, if you've ever seen a, a complex cable in a TV network or a, a telephone system, you realize that there's a, a whole lot of little wires there that all have to be hooked up exactly right, and I think the same would apply to the eyeball. So I think that would be an awful long way down the pipe. Thank you, sir. Go ahead. Thank you. I believe that the good doctor said that, you know, the uh, government pays all costs of the operations outside of the, this province, like in the United States. Right. I think, in fact, they only pay for the operation if it's not available in Canada. That's the entire operation. Please clarify. Yeah, that's correct. If the operation is available in, in British Columbia and you choose Canada and you had to go to the U.S. for a heart transplant, then we would pay the uh, medical costs uh, for that, we being the government of British Columbia. Uh, as for instance, you will be playing the, the government of uh, Edmonton, the government of Alberta, Alberta yeah. for that recent heart operation. Yeah, the, the patient will not have to pay for it to, to Alberta. Go ahead from Quinnell. Yes, I'm the mother of a child who has had a so far successful kidney transplant. <laughs> And we were told at the time of his transplant that if the donor card has been witnessed that the family cannot uphold your wishes to have your uh, kidney or, or any other organ donated, does that still hold? Do you mean to say that if you have signed the card and the family don't want you to donate that the family cannot uh, prevail? No, we were told that if you had your donor card witnessed at the time you signed it that the family yes. could not uphold your wishes. They could not? Do you mean couldn't, couldn't oppose your wishes? Yes. Yeah. In other words, if it was a witness dog and transplant request, the family couldn't oppose your wishes. Well, Dr. Hutchinson, I think, made it clear that you, you will not take an organ with, against the, without the approval of the family. No, I think legally you could, but uh, the legality of it certainly isn't the whole problem. We would, I, I can't see any physician taking an organ against the wishes of, a, of, a, of the uh, surviving family. Despite whatever has been signed. Despite whatever has been signed and despite the legalities, that wouldn't, ha wouldn't happen. Okay, ma'am. Thank you very much. Thank you. Go ahead, please. Yes, good morning, doctor. Good morning. Uh, <clears throat> my question is, I'm almost 65, and I hope to last a while longer, but does the age of the donor have any bearing on it? It Would does. Would you turn on somebody that's 70 years old or thereabouts? For hearts, it definitely does. The uh, age at the moment is about 40 for a donor. Uh, livers uh, also, we like to have the, uh, the liver come from somebody who's relatively young. However, on the kidney side, uh, successful transplants have been done using donors 65, 70 and older. Some doctors don't think that that's uh, reasonable, but certainly I'm aware of cases where it's worked out very well indeed. So don't give up the ship. Your kidneys might be all right to be passed on to somebody else. Well, I'm sure as a lot of elderly people have them thoughts. Well, I suppose it would speak quite clinically if, uh, if uh, the, the, the wish was there and approved that the doctors would have necessarily conduct the autopsy, look at the item and decide to use it or not. Oh, okay, it, thank you very much, doctor. Is that too brittle? No, it would depend on the health of the person. I mean, just because somebody is 65 doesn't necessarily uh, tell you all you want to know about the health of the person. Go ahead, please. Good morning, Mr. Webster and Dr. Hutchison. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, twice I signed my donor card, and my husband became very agitated and quite upset by it. Um, I was wondering, he's more concerned with um, after death for an open coffin. Um, would that be possible, or, is, or he's worried that there's quite a bit of... Um, oh, you mean, is it possible still to have an open coffin after a transplant, and after a, donating an organ? Yes, indeed, it would be. I see. Thank you very much, then. Thank you. That was an unusual question, but mm. that's the kind of thing people are sensitive about. That's right. Go ahead from Robert's Creek. Uh, at the moment, if this is, as I understand it, an opting-in system. We uh, have to sign up if we're in favor of donating uh, organs. I understand that in some jurisdictions, uh, probably abroad as far as I know, not in Canada, right. there is an opting-out system whereby you're automatically um, allowed to do uh, now, it is automatically possible for, for physicians to take organs unless you have said that you do not wish this to be done. This seems to me a more effective system. I'd like to hear your opinion and if there is any, poss any consideration being given to this being done here. Yes, indeed, we have considered it and it's been discussed uh, nationally as well as provincially. 
but I think a lot of people would find that repugnant. Uh, again, as I say, we could uh, uh, obtain organs simply on the donor card, but... Yes, but uh, why is it repugnant if, if you have every opportunity to say, I don't wish this to be done? I mean... Um, well, because people are funny, you know. I don't know how many uh, people, for instance, in the studio have their wills done, but I bet there's a lot that don't. And I'm sure that there would be a lot of people who would not uh, take the trouble to uh, say that they didn't want to have their organs used, even though they wouldn't, because it, it means dealing with death and thinking ahead, and, and uh, certainly people are a little reluctant to do that. Uh, there are arguments for it and against it, uh, and you're quite right, there are some jurisdictions where this has been tried. My understanding is that it hasn't worked out very well. It has actually caused a backlash. People have been so upset at the uh, concept of being more or less uh, assumed to be a donor that the transplant program has actually had uh, a setback. Oh, well, that's <coughs> interesting. I must be cold-blooded. I can't see what all the fuss is about. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you, thank you. But there are overtones of authoritarianism in it. I suppose that's what really sticks in the car. Mind you, if the medical profession comes to the stage, whereby they can, as a matter of routine, take kidneys, livers, hearts, lungs, and do them, the public demand for this service would be such that we'd go to the other system and you'd take them first because you could save so many more lives. Well, I'd rather have it done on a, on a voluntary basis yeah. like our blood bank where people were educated, knew that this was a good thing to do, and did it more or less automatically. Uh, we only get about 10% of the potential donors, less than 10% of the potential donors right now. If we could get that up to even 30%, we'd have uh, more than enough kidneys to transplant all the people that need transplanting in BC right now. So, so you don't get many kidneys now? We're only getting fewer than 10% of the potential right now. And you use every one you get that's in good enough condition to use? If we don't use it, we make sure it's used somewhere else. Some, somewhere else. some go to other centers. So the pitch really is for kidneys. That's a proven, tried, successful operation done in our facilities in British Columbia. Indeed. So VGH has been doing them since 1968 and has done hundreds. St. Paul's is going to start do, doing them this year. And the uh, success rate is, is very, very good. In one five final, years, 65 percent of them One final question before I let you go. Those who wish to indicate that they will donate their organs or an organ, how, do you, how can they best do it? Not the driver's license, merely by telling the relatives and the next of kin to tell what after. I think that's probably the most effective way is making sure that your next of kin understand your wishes and making sure your doctors understand your wishes. Tell your doctor and tell your next of kin. I would like to maybe have the card changed so that you have to have it witnessed by your next of kin so that would indicate that you had at least discussed it with your wife or your husband. And if anyone wants to do it right now, is there any place that you want them to do it to? The best mechanism right now is still the driver's license card. The dri and it's on the driver's license? I believe so. My thanks to Dr. Hutchinson, the BC Transplant Society and the Hospital Administration of Victoria. Thanks, Doc. Thank Next, you. I'm going to have a free-for-all after the break. Just by the way, do you remember the last municipal elections when at the NPA nominating meeting the directors refused to take nominations from the floor? and only ratified their own selection of hand-picked candidates, the non-partisan association. That means the anti-NDP association that wants to get rid of Harcourt. And remember the kind of charade when their choice for mayor, Bill Vanderzam, he wouldn't join the ticket until they collected names on a draft Vanderzam petition. Well, they've outdone themselves this year in preparation for the school board elections called by, in such haste by the education minister. Yes, the NPA will hold a nomination meeting tomorrow night. No, press and reporters will not be allowed to attend. Party members will not attend. They won't be allowed in either. And about the 17 people who said they want to run for the NPA, can they come? In fact, they're not welcome either. And the board of directors will pick and choose, and then in great open-handed democratic fashion, let everybody know a day or two later who is going to be running. Now, free for all. Where are we? Go ahead, please. Hello? Yes, yes. Yes, uh, Jack, is this Jack? Yes, yes. Um, I, I was noticing uh, when you were getting on the Sky Train, uh, the lady ahead of you, the door closed very suddenly. Yes. Uh, what would happen, supposing someone is there in the summertime with a flimsy dress on, 
and and uh, the dress got caught in the door. Is that uh, sensitive enough that it would uh, open? You know, it could carry her right through, right down the track. Oh, don't let's uh, don't let's uh, predict uh, doom and gloom. If the door is not properly closed, the train will not start. Oh, a, a little, a small piece of fabric then would be sensitive enough to uh, open the door. I don't know. As long as there's something more substantial, like a pair of shoulders in between the door, I think you'd be perfectly safe. But as I said this morning, people in this part of the world have got to start to step lively and be alert, not like the pedestrians in Vancouver who wander across the road at two and a half centimeters an hour. Yeah. Well, I was just thinking, you know, if there's a wind and somebody's uh, the flimsy dress, the skirt, the bottom hopefully, part of the skirt got caught in that. Hopefully, the weight of the bod would rip off the dress. Yeah, I would hope so before it would be. It was just a thought because oh, I know, all I of know. a sudden, you know. Step lively. Be alert. Step lively. Go ahead, please. Yes, Mr. Webster. Uh, yesterday on the Softnow case, you were talking about the Winnipeg police doing a, a poor job investigating the Softnow. Egg on the face. Yes. Um... Did he not explain, as he explained to yourself yesterday, uh, his alibis? Yes. Um, what about his lawyers? Did, uh, through three cases, couldn't they do something that was uh, a yeah. little better than the job they did to... Uh... No, they did the job. I mean, normally the police will, pre will, pre will present a fairly exhaustive investigation at the first trial, but even at the first trial there was a hung jury. As I recall from the W5 story, it was the lawyers who did the checking on the Canadian tire alibi. The police found the phone a ticket to his mother in Vancouver, and it was a woman who came forward, the principal witness, to say that, yes, she had seen him at the hospital at 8.15 at night. No, it looked to me, and certainly on the basis of what the Manitoba Court of Appeals said, that the Winnipeg police did not do a very good job of presenting the potential alibis for uh, Sofino. On the face of it, it seems to me that he was, in fact, innocent. I also believe that his lawyers didn't do a very good job, though, with the way it sounded yesterday. No, you cannot count on lawyers doing a bad job merely because you lose the case. I, I could quote you cases in Vancouver where people may even have gone to the gallows because the lawyers didn't do that good a job, but the case was pretty hard against the accused in any case. Okay, thank you. No, I was the... Uh, Sofano has a... Uh, 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 a little bit of an odd personality, but the guy is very forthright, and I was pleased with what he told me, and I spent several hours with him apart before I had him on the air. All right, thanks for And I think W5 did a very good sum up of the whole story on the Sunday night before. Go ahead from Rupert. Hello, Jack. How you doing? Not bad. Now, listen, I just heard you talking yesterday about your golf game in Hawaii there on your holidays. Yeah. Um, remember when you were in Bermuda a couple years ago, you played a game? Yes. But you played against my father down there. Mr. Medeiros? Oh, Medeiros, that's uh, right. Anyway, he's on his way up to Vancouver about uh, June or July, and he wants a rematch, something about $20 or something. 20 20 and 20 Yeah. He okay. wants to get a rematch for you. He'll be up in about June or July, and he said he wants to get a game with you. Okay, what's his, with what's his handicap, the liar? Uh, about nine. About nine, okay. Mine just went up to 30. 30. No, 20, 18. Well, it depends how much I'm playing for. Ah, okay. Okay, oh. give me a call in July. Okay. I remember him quite well, Nicholas Medeiros. That's the one. <laughs> okay, Jack, Bye. thanks a lot. Bye. That's automatic reflex. That's not memory. Go ahead, please. Morning, Jack. Yeah. Hello? Yes, yes. Yeah, I would like to talk to you about a student loan. I went for a loan at BCIT last week, and since I'm on unemployment insurance, I seem to make too much money to receive a loan. Now, they'd rather keep you on unemployment than help you re-school uh, yourself. You can't get a loan because you're in UIC. I make too much money on UIC. To get a loan. Right. Now, if I went to Manpower, Manpower won't pay for the course because it's not under their program. So... Who are you trying to get the student loan from? The provincial government? Well, it's for continuing education at uh, BCIT. I don't know the score on that at all. Are you telling me that the position you face now is that a person drawing UIC cannot get a student loan? That's correct. And if you want to go on welfare, yeah, you still will make too much money. They'll only pay so much for your course, and then you're left with, well, 
If I went, I'd be left with $400 for two months. Give me your phone number. Okay. J just a minute. Give me your phone number. Uh-huh. I'll call you back. Back. After the break. One obvious response I should have made to the young chap who couldn't get a uh, student loan at BCIT because he was a new IC is that you can't go to school yeah. or you can't draw UIC unless you're ready, yeah. willing, and able and available to go to work. That would seem to be the actual chopper in itself, I suppose. So therefore, you must get some other government grant, uh, Canada Manpower Grant, which will support you to some extent, and then you drop the UIC for the time you're at the school, I should imagine. But we'll try and find some more about it. Go ahead, please. Good morning, Mr. Webster. Morning. It's Howard Faulkner speaking, and you, you might recall I ran for alderman in 84 and will be running again in 86, and I wanted to thank you for pointing out how undemocratic the NPA are. People kept asking me, Howard, why aren't you running for the NPA? And I kept saying, you can't run for them. They won't let you. They're totally undemocratic. Well, and you'll recall when they had Jim Harvey and he disagreed with them that he, they threw him off their slate immediately. Did he make it? Uh, no, he didn't. He lost without their support. But I intend to win as an independent and be an independent voice in this city. Now, the NPA are an archaic, antediluvian, outdated, non-democratic organization. I couldn't agree with you more. That doesn't necessarily mean that I support COPE. Uh, me either. Or NDP. <laughs> Thank you for clarifying that in the public mind. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Go ahead, please. Good morning, Mr. Webster. Morning, madam. I was wanting to know, uh, does this guy train have an information phone number of his own? I can't find it anywhere. Oh, I'm and sure. And can you use your senior's bus pass on it? Oh. And it's time, dear. <laughs> just a minute, just a minute, just a minute. Okie doke. It doesn't say day past week, adult concession, I'll pick first, blah, 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 blah. I don't see an information telephone number, and I don't know the answer. No, it's quite a puzzle. I guess the only way is to go to a station. Uh, Anne, would you please find out the two points? One, is it an information number? And yes. two... two... 324 Three, two, four, three, two, one, one. Three, two, four. Three, two, one, one. Three, two, one, one. And can you use a senior's bus pass? Yes. Yeah. You can? You can? You can. Just a minute. People are saying yes. Yeah. Okay, for the moment we'll say yes. Well, thank you very much. Oh, yeah, 324 3211. Thank you very much. And by the way, don't smoke on the train. I saw you yesterday and you were smoking. I was not. I gave it up. Okay, bye. Bye. <laughs> Some of these women are just terrible the way they smoke everywhere. Go ahead, please. Good morning, Mr. Webster. Morning. Um, I have a problem this past weekend with the post office. My brother's birthday was on Saturday, so Thursday the 2nd, I mailed a special delivery letter to Regina. The letter did not arrive in Regina until yesterday morning the 6th, and it was delivered by a regular postman. From the Regina end, they checked into the post office there and said the letter did not come into Regina until yesterday morning because of fog in the Vancouver area that would not allow the planes out on the weekend. I checked with Transport Canada. There were no major airlines fogged in or delayed by fog this weekend. So what's Canada Post's excuse? <laughs> Can I get my two bucks back for the 234 yeah. that I paid for this four-day letter? The official value is that Canada Post, on that occasion, was in its own fog, because I don't think there was any fog at the Well, I, I checked with Transport Canada, because I thought, I'm not buying this story either. You know, <laughs> and I checked, and, and they said, no, no major delays. Well, I have tried to get the postie, the postmaster of the region here on the air, but he's too shy to come on the air to answer questions. Well, uh, do I have a hope of getting my $2 back from them? Naughty. Hope and blessings. Oh, dear. <laughs> Thanks, Mom, but I've given you $2 worth of public complaining. Well, thank you. And the lady at the post office, she said, while you're at it, can you complain about the lack of glue on the stamps? <laughs> she said she's tired of licking her chops trying to get these suckers to stick. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> Such colorful language. Ty, what's she say? 
tired of licking her chops trying to get these suckers to stick. Go ahead, please. Jack. Yeah. Yeah, are you a fisherman? Well, I'm an angler, if that's what you angler, mean. Angler, yeah, okay. Well, I live out in Coquitlam here, and I'd just like to uh, see if you can get anybody on your show here to uh, make some beef about that Coquitlam River. It is just a disgusting mess from all the gravel pit operations further up. You've been talking about this for 20 years. Yeah, but maybe we can get somebody in there this time and do something about it this year. It is a mess. Uh, I was out there the other day, and it just silt, and they got a new operation starting up. It doesn't seem to be doing any good. Is that in the city of Coquitlam or in Port Co uh, Poco? Well, up top it's in Coquitlam, but it flows through Port Coquitlam after a while. I'll put it on my list. Gravel mess in the Port Coquitlam River. Yeah. Okay, bye. Go ahead, please. Good morning, Jack. Morning. I just wanted to get your reaction in the new year this year about the petroleum issue here on the uh, west coast of Canada. You mean the price? What do you think about the uh, gas prices going up with our lower American uh, prices uh, in the south at your own newsmen did a story about, and also especially with Expo coming, isn't it a way to sort of rip off our tourists we expect to get here? Well, even Curtis, the social credit finance minister, is talking about taking a look at the automatic increase by inflation, and I'm going to have him on the air about it, and I'll give him a good nag as soon as I can. But uh, I think the price of gas has gone beyond all reason for all people. Yeah, especially, you know, Jack, it's amazing. It seems the only ones that don't give a darn are the ones that can afford to walk in any station and buy this stuff uh, for their cars because they're making such uh, great wages that they don't care. Goodbye. I'll follow it up. Thanks, Thanks a million. Got to go after the break. Jack Monroe is going to be here tomorrow as one of the commissioners on the investigation into unemployment insurance. That should raise some heat tomorrow because what the Tories are doing nowadays is pretty tough indeed. So we'll have Monroe and a couple of other commissioners, not all the program, tomorrow on Webster at 9 a.m. precisely. <laughs> Expo 86, 115 days to go. Royal Commission on Unemployment Insurance at 9 a.m. precisely. Oh, I'm sorry. What happened? This is for the tent. Yeah, but I missed your sign somewhere. You were shouting out loud, weren't you? I don't know, my fault. So, uh, Ten seconds. Jack Monroe is one of the commissioners of inquiry looking into the unemployment insurance scheme and problems. And he and others will be here tomorrow at 9 a.m. precisely.